Welcome to the inaugural podcast in connection with BC Law Impact Mental Health blog series. In 2022, after a series of panels with BC Law alumni sharing their stories of struggle and recovery from mental health and substance use issues, a number of alumni have come forward and bravely shared their stories of overcoming various issues, recovery, and stories of hope. We're launching this podcast series as a further opportunity to amplify these stories. The podcast format gives us time and space to dig into these stories and allow us to explore these issues in more depth. Mike Cavoto has written a blog post for us, which will be shared on BC Law Impact's blog site. We'll post show notes to this podcast with further resources. It's our hope that these stories will create a sense of community and connection with BC Law students and alumni. These stories are of both vulnerability and resilience, and they offer insight and resources to those who may be struggling. Most importantly, they offer hope. They show a way forward for those who may be struggling. I should say that the topics we'll discuss today could be sensitive to some and do involve serious issues, including the issue of death by suicide. If you or a loved one are experiencing suicidal thoughts, please reach out to the National Suicide Hotline. The number is 988. You can text it, you can use the chat, or you can call, and someone will be there to help you. Mike, thank you for joining us. This is our first podcast. Congratulations. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> so let me give the, the people watching a little bit of a background, but I want you to fill in the gap. So I, I saw a parallel this morning when I was looking at your background, and you graduated in 2019 from BC Law, right? That's right. So I graduated also, also with a 19, but unfortunately in the wrong part of the, uh, the, the number. It's a 1992. So that's uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, but I have been back to the law school recently, and some things look like they haven't changed at all. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, where'd you grow up? Uh, where did uh, where did this all begin? Yeah. So thanks for the intro, Jim. And uh, I thought you were going to say uh, 1919 for a second. And I was going to say, oh yeah, a little far back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, it, it's it's great to be here. It's it's truly an honor to be able to share my story. So um, kind of my my background is I grew up in Connecticut. Um, I am a first, the first lawyer in my family. Uh, I'm the first, you know, kind of person to go on that higher education path beyond beyond college. And uh, I went to BC for undergrad too. Couldn't get enough of it. Went to BC for law school. So you know, put seven years of time into Boston College, and I love the institution. I think the people in the administration are fabulous. I think the students are fabulous, and I just really love the thing I love most of all about the schools is, is the sense of community you know I'm here with you we've connected over this we've had such good conversations over the last couple of months and uh it, it this is this is what it's all about you know so I'm very happy and very honored to be here um even if I'm sharing a, a somewhat uh you know bittersweet story we'll say excellent I noticed in, in undergrad you majored in psychology so tell me about the transition from a psychology major to a law student did you bring anything over with you when you studied in law school? It was, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny you bring that up. I, psychology was a fascinating field for me to study too, because I just think that it touches kind of all aspects of professionalism. You know, if, if I could go back and my, look at my 18 year old self when I was picking a major, I suppose I picked the major when I was 19, but if I could go back and, and, see what I was thinking. I think it would look something like this because this is, this is a while ago now. You know, my, my 10 year anniversary is coming up in June. Um, psychology is a field that people, people think that psychology is something that touches all aspects of life. And in my experience, it's, it's, it's true. A lot of things tend to be um, uh, colloquialized and made into armchair psychology, but the science behind um, what psychologists and psychiatrists do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, especially when they're, you know, focused on helping others. I think that, uh, that, that is fantastic. And that's really what it's all about too. So I kind of entered, I entered my undergrad 
career uh, with a psychology major because I wanted to do something that I could apply broadly. It's the study of, uh, you know, uh, of people um, and sociology and psychology are complementary in that regard. So I really feel strongly that it was a, it was a good major choice. It was something that gave me a little bit of science and it's something that gave me uh, a lot of exposure to things that I hadn't thought about really at that point in my life, including um, uh, mental health issues and uh, people who are you know, fighting through that on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what motivated you to go to law school? Law school, law school was always a goal of mine. And my motivation, actually, I was inspired to go to law school in undergrad, but I received so much feedback from practitioners that were like, maybe you should really think about this, uh, that I did think about it. I said, I'm going to go find a job in the private sector. Um, and if, in a couple of years, I think that this is still a path that I want to pursue, then I'm going to pursue it. And I actually was even more motivated to go to law school after uh, working for a couple of years in the technology industry. Um, I was working at a software company and my interactions with the in-house attorneys, they were just fantastic. So they were consummate professionals. Uh, I really enjoyed learning from them and working with them. And I felt that a good attorney is someone who just gets the job done. And that's really been kind of my driving and motivating force uh, since then. So, you know, took the LSAT, worked full time, took the LSAT, uh, decided to go to law school and never really looked back. Excellent. And it looks like after law school, you had a mixed experience, right? You've had a big law experience and then you've had an in-house experience. Exactly. That? That's that's exactly right. And that's kind of always been the, uh, I, I enjoy touching many areas of, of business and that's kind of intellectually stimulating for me. So the firm, I worked at a firm in, in Boston. It was a fantastic place to work. And I stay in touch with a lot of uh, attorneys there still. And genuinely, they're just great people. So uh, I made the jump over to um, uh, a big company in Boston and learned a ton. And then most recently, I went back into software. The software world is really where I feel most at home. And I can kind of incorporate both my skill sets of, uh, you know, being in the software environment prior to law school, like the business side of things, and also be uh, a practitioner in the technology space. And it's it's been a it's been a wild ride. We'll put it that way. It's been an absolutely wild ride. So I have to tell people that you and I have a, kind of a unique connection. That if anyone has enjoyed a harpoon beer or or anything from Boston Beer Works, there was a time where your company made the beer and my old company made the bottle. So between us, we were completely responsible for people's um, pleasure in joining, uh, enjoying alcoholic beverages or adult beverages. So, you know, sometimes people wonder what lawyers do and whether they do anything important for society. I think at that moment in time, maybe we did. Yeah, the, the, the vertical integration of <laughs> delivering um, uh, some good, some good products from the Boston Beer Company is <laughs> that's part of my career that I look back with uh, a lot of fond memories. Excellent, excellent. So then we have this interesting development. So you're kind of a Connecticut Yankee living in Dallas. So tell us what that's all about. That's right. So I, I didn't include this in the initial initial introduction, but I, I moved down to Dallas uh, a couple of months ago, and you know I've always kind of wanted to live in Texas, and especially after the uh, 2015. Maybe I'm dating myself with some of the listeners here. But the 2015 winter in Boston, I don't know how anyone stayed in the city. There was snow piled up until I, I, I want to say right before the 4th of July, there were still snow piles melting in uh, some of the depositories around Boston. And uh, that made me that made me think about where I, my next move would be. And I finally executed on that in uh, uh, the past couple of months. And I've basically just been hopping around, trying all the different barbecue spots down here and trying to figure out where I can get a good New Haven style slice of pizza. Still haven't found the latter, but I've found plenty of the former. I would think so. So maybe that'll be an opportunity for you. You can bring that West. That would, hey, sign me up. All right, excellent. Well, was, uh, I'm a big fan of Lyle, love it. And he's got a great line that uh, you're not from Texas, but Texas loves you anyway. So hopefully <laughs> you can earn that accolade at some point there. So, so Mike, I do want to transition back to law school because this is, is really why we're here today and, and what we want to discuss. So when you were in law school, you had a particularly traumatic event. Could you take us through that? Yeah, of course. So this is, yeah, no, this is kind of the, the reason that we're, we're here today. So my 
my third, you know, I, I go through law school and fairly typical path. Um, first year is a real tough year and working, trying to be learn as much as I can, um, going to all my classes and, and, you know, stressing over finals and whatnot and uh, making some good friends along the way. And then the second year, kind of more of the same, um, have a little bit more of a foundation under me, but really kind of, you know, just trying to piece together what the heck I'm supposed to be doing in the first place. Uh, and, and things are things are kind of coming together. And then the third year for me too, I really felt um, like I've hit my stride and I'm doing you know, well in classes and taking classes that I'm really interested in taking and deepening relationships with a lot of classmates, uh, most of whom I keep in touch with today and super grateful for that. Um, and then my, my second semester, just before graduation, uh, early March of my second semester, 3L year, um, my stepdad died by suicide. And he was um, just a, a real, he had a huge impact on, on my life, my family's life. And, you know, he, he was just a larger than life personality. Um, he was a, he was a, he was a cop, uh, in the town next to where I grew up. And, uh, it was a, a sh absolute shock. We, we really didn't have a ton of, a ton of, uh, warning that anything was really seriously, seriously wrong. You know, everyone kind of has, um, their issues and everyone works through things differently, but it, it really took me and my family completely by shock. So almost overnight, um, a lot of my support system was fundamentally changed and, and it kind of still to this day feels like kind of before that day and after that day uh, in my life. So it, it was a, a very, very challenging event. And, um, you know, kind of the, you know, Mark was, his name was Mark. Mark was, Mark was just a fabulous person. And I think about him often still. So thank you. Thanks for asking about that, Jim. And this is kind of the, um, the reason that we're, we're chatting today. So you mentioned that your support network changed from that moment on. What was the change? Yeah, it, you know, you think for me, and the only thing that I can speak of is my own experience. You know, this is, this is kind of my goal today is to, um, just provide some of my experiences and, and, what I've, I've had to deal with from my own perspective. So that's, that's all I can uh, speak to. So my interaction with my support network um, had always been, I had felt like a caregiver a lot of the times too, or maybe not felt like a caregiver, but I've I kind of assumed that stability role, that stable role where I was kind of, uh, you know, always had a reasonable idea of what was going on, a reasonable idea of which way forward was. And, uh, uh, a lot of, I felt like a lot of my family and friends kind of relied on me for that. So almost overnight it, it shifted and I felt very reliant on my support network for support emotionally. Um, and it was, it was a quite a jarring change for me too, but the, the, the rub really was most of my core support network was also going through this too. And as opposed to, you know, everyone kind of figuring out their own path, everyone is figuring out their own path through a similar traumatic experience too. So it was, it was a, a real challenge for me to understand how I was supposed to go forward and, and figure out where forward was, while at the same time, my support network was also trying to figure out um, where the compass was pointing for them too. Did you find that you had to change your support network at all? I, I did. And I don't, it wasn't really a conscious decision. Um, I think everyone, a big theme that I reflect, reflecting on this, uh, you know, this is a couple, this was uh, several years ago now, and I have the benefit of hindsight, but looking back on it, it was kind of a, an analysis that was going on where I had to recalibrate myself and I had to understand where people could provide me support, where I could provide support to others, and uh, kind of how that balance worked, what that balance was even. Uh, it, I think the best kind of way to put it is I received a lot of support from very unexpected sources, and I'm extremely grateful for that, that I was even open to that at the time. Um, 
And I think I, at first, I might have been a little over reliant on my built in support network. It was my family, my close friends, um, my relationship, my, you know, my, my partner at the time. And it was really challenging to understand how to properly bring up trauma with them. And I ended up, I ended up being able to get a very good therapist and I uh, spoke with my therapist in depth on this and kind of process things a little bit more fully through this, uh, you know, through this event and through the death of Mark and through the aftermath thereof. So to summarize, I did have to change my support network a little bit to cast a wider net and to be more gentle, I think, with my built in support network, because they were also going undergoing horrific trauma. And uh, I hope no one else, you know, obviously, this is a empty hope, but I really do hope that we can get that no one has to go through something like that ever again. And if they do, I hope that they're a little bit better equipped than I was to uh, accept help from the outside. You mentioned that you received support from unexpected sources. What, what did that look like? Who are those sources? Yeah. So the, um, yeah, everyone kind of thinks therapists are perfectly equipped to deal with all sorts of things. And in my experience, my, my time with a the therapist was extremely valuable and I wouldn't trade that for anything, but that relationship is supplanted was supplanted, um, excuse me, supplanted is not the right word, was complemented by my interactions with um, uh, people in the BC law community, for example, like Dina Bene, uh, before she retired, she was a very important person in, in kind of my recovery and my understanding that there is no clear path forward from grief. Um, grief is something that there's no playbook for really. You know, like people talk about the stages of grief, but that's not really, I wish it was as cut and dry as that, but uh, it, it's it's really, Dina Bene did a great job of just sitting with me. She was at the time um, a relative stranger to me, but she'd gone out of her way when I'd informed the school of what happened, she'd gone out of her way to reach out and connect with me and sit with me. And I think that was really important um, for me because sitting with her forced me to sit with myself a little bit more and uh, happy to happy to talk a little bit more about that too if that's that's relevant right now well it is and one of the things that is fascinating about your account is you talk a lot about dichotomies you know where mm. I think when we go through traumatic events we think that our support network will help solve our problems right we lean into them because we're desperate to find answers and your story of your interaction with the dean was not that. Uh, she didn't have solutions for you. She wasn't a therapist. So what was that like? That's exactly right. And I think that's kind of the, that is the really challenging part about this is there's no, for me, there was no clear path. As someone who relatively had, you know, kind of an understanding of the path forward. And I think a lot of law students and a lot of, you know, practitioners are paid uh, well, maybe law students aren't paid, but you know the lawyers are paid to solve problems, identify and solve problems, and they're just it, everything was just so obfuscated. It was it was very hard to think clearly. It was very hard to put kind of one foot in front of the other. Um, and Dina Bene, she didn't have the answers, and that was okay. And just like you said, Jim, which I, I really think you you know put the nail hit the nail on the head there. She. There, there was just, there's so many conflicting things that were going on in me at that time um, that just having someone kind of express patience and calmness, even though she was a stranger um, when we first started uh, meeting, it was very, very, very helpful for me too. And we kind of built that relationship um, just based on her presence and her kindness, I think most importantly. Do you think there's an element there where people who are able to just walk with you almost give you permission to just be where you are? That's exactly right. And in my experience, my core support network didn't know where they were the same way I didn't know where I was. So having, having 
having someone who had that permissive that gave me that permission to sit down and just eat a sandwich in her office with her <laughs> once a week. Yeah. You know, that that's how simple, that's almost how simple it was, where it wasn't a therapy situation. She wasn't my therapist and made it very clear. And we both made it understood that that was not what that time was for. Um, she just let me bring up whatever I wanted to bring up. Mm. We talked about the weather. We talked about, you know, her life. We talked about my life. We talked about career goals. We talked about Mark when it was relevant. We talked about um, Boston College. We, we had a really, it was just a very easy relationship to have, you know, and I, I wasn't, it wasn't a therapy relationship, like I said, where I was in there for an hour with the goal of, with, with a goal. Mm. And uh, it was, it was a very formative for me. And I think it was really a, a foundational experience because her kindness and because of um, that permission, just like you said, for me to kind of just feel what I was feeling at that time, but also processing it, not, it wasn't something that I was coming in uh, and just unleashing all of my unfiltered emotion on her either, because, you know, we had, we had a relationship that was um, based in kind of that mutual respect. And, and she didn't know a ton of details when we first started meeting about me too. So hmm. that, that permissiveness to just, Hey, we're going to spend some time together if you'd like, and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about, but that kind of forced that self-reflection on me. What do I want to talk about? You know, what, what am I feeling today? How am I feeling? And answering that question, which I think is, was a lot more difficult than I thought um, it was going to be to answer that question at, you know, every Wednesday at noon when we met. Mm. Mm. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what I fondly call the blood sport of finding a proper therapist. But I'm going to pause on that because I think your experience really touches on a debate that we're seeing with respect to mental health and trauma, the role of non-therapists, what I would mm -hmm. think of as almost peer-to-peer -peer support. And there's a fascinating program out of Africa called Strong Minds, where you know their ratio of psychiatrists and therapists to the population is, is a handful per million. Not surprisingly, the US has a much better ratio, but we'll get to that in a minute, not necessarily maybe enough. Um, a psychiatrist there started a program that is lightly trained grandmothers and mothers, but mostly grandmothers, who literally sit on benches and are available to speak to people with mild to moderate anxiety, depression, or mental health issues. They're not therapists. They mm -hmm. sit with people. And there's now been uh, you know, peer-reviewed studies of the impact of that showing that it has at least as beneficial uh, an impact on the patients than you know, clinical therapy. So I think it's an area of our society that we do need to expand and, and be more creative about, um, not hold people to, if they don't know how to be a therapist, they can't offer something. And I think it's as simple as having a lived experience. And, and as we mentioned, just giving time and a place. So interesting that that was reflected in your experience by someone who probably didn't have the training either, but just in her heart knew that there was something that she could do. I, I couldn't agree more. And that's a, fa that's a fascinating study and a fascinating program too. And I think that that's kind of what we're, uh, hopefully that we're attempting to do here with this program as well. And, you know, just the suggestion that people are not as alone as they think maybe. Um, is sometimes a hard pill to swallow. And I think that was a challenge for me too. And that's kind of, and on my, on reflecting, uh, I, I think that that was particularly challenging for me because it was such a severe event, something that happened all of a sudden that um, that lack of relatability, just it's a chasm. It felt like a chasm. It felt like something unable, I was unable to cross um, and with the people who had experienced that loss with me too, you know, they had their own chasms with me and, uh, you know, we, the, my family and, and friends obviously held stuck together tightly, but just like you said, that, that kind of middle ground between, uh, a friend 
and a therapist, that is an area that I think is very lightly touched um, in our mental health support system today. Absolutely. So let's talk about therapists and uh, the the uh, hand to hand combat of finding a therapist. What was your experience like? <laughs> it sucked. <laughs> yeah. It was right. it was it was such a challenge, and it's it almost is the, the system itself is very opaque. You know, the the core of what you're going for here is you want to find someone you jive with. You want to find someone who's going to understand where you're coming from, uh, do their thing, and then that's going to be kind of, that's going to be what you're looking for at the very core. It is so hard to actually find that. I, yeah, I, this was not my first foray into therapy. I'd have a therapist before, but you, different therapists had different specialties. So you need to kind of find, you know, you go on your health insurances. Ideally, this is this is what you should do. You should go on your health insurances website, find a list of supported therapists, see who's taking patients, make a few calls, have a few introductory meetings, and then pick your therapist and go to therapy. That is extremely overwhelming when you are not 100%. And I, for me, as someone who, I, I'm a pretty functional human, I think. It was almost it was almost too much to even think about. I would be I was very easily discouraged. It was something that I viewed as, um, you know, a, a chore, and it was a chore. I think that's putting it kindly. It was it was a chore, and what I ended up doing and, and having to kind of share and open up that wound, that traumatic wound that you've experienced multiple times in a triage situation where you're not sure if this therapist is going to be the right person for you. That's in and of itself a very difficult thing to do. That's a heavy lift. So, you know, this is a fresh wound for me. And I'm kind of going out and putting myself out there and interviewing a couple of therapists, those who I found were taking my insurance and also who were taking uh, new patients, which in Boston, even though there's a ton of therapists in Boston relative to the rest of the world, there's a lot of people that also need therapy and there's a lot of demand for that and uh, kind of. Um, it, it, it provided a huge challenge for me. And I, I just, I just, this is pre COVID too, right? So now I would imagine that demand has only increased and it was a, it was a very difficult task. So I eventually found someone that I did connect with. Um, he did not take my insurance and I kind of just ate the cost because you know the juice was worth the squeeze there it was a it was a economic decision that i made and um you know when you're a law student money's kind of tight uh, so but that was something that i i kind of prioritized i knew i needed to go talk to someone and uh, i was i was i was helped by my you know my significant other um and my family to kind of go find um the help that i needed to find and um you know, we started, we started talking and, uh, it was a really, it was a long, a long term commitment. Essentially. I, I met with this therapist for over two years and he was a great resource. And, um, the advice that I would give for people who are, you know, on the fence about, um, finding a therapist is you, it's helpful. It's helpful to have someone else with you if you can to do some of the legwork for you provide you with a couple options and then uh, just be there to kind of support you. Um, when you find a therapist that doesn't work out, that's, you know, it almost feels like you're going back to, you know, back to zero in that game. But I, I just encourage you to stick with it. If you can, the, per the system's not perfect, but the, the help that they can provide. If you, once you do get with a therapist that you do connect with, um, I think the benefits are uh, very real, very tangible. And uh, I'm not going to say immediate, but if you work at it, um, you really can see some improvements. Yeah, and I think that we've talked a lot about dichotomies and the irony of getting help. That's one of the, the critical ones that in your worst time, you're still expected to be an informed consumer. And if you're lucky enough to get somebody, but then that person isn't right for you, quote unquote, firing them and starting all over again. And, you know, in not knowing frankly, what's going to work because you haven't done it before. So 
incredibly difficult process, but I think what I'm hearing from you and I know from my own experience is you have to do it because it's a critical part of your recovery is finding that relationship. And it is a relationship. It's not um, Sermon on the Mount. Therapist tells you what to do. You're okay. You know, it, it is a communication and a relationship of trust. So um, it's a real challenge for many people, I would say, that are that are suffering. It's a it's a lengthy process. takes takes longer than it should. It's a costly process, as you mentioned. Very few therapists that I'm aware of are on healthcare insurance mm -hmm. plans, so that makes it prohibitive for some people. Uh, and you know, the ability to see them frequently or, or even regularly is, is difficult now with, with patient loads. So certainly part of our, our delivery system, if you will, that, that could use improving. Absolutely. And, and Jim, kind of, I, I, I know this is a, a, this is a conversation between the two of us. So kind of what were your experiences with finding a, a therapist? So just as a quick um, summary, I, I've experienced anxiety and depression yeah. in my life. I've gone through two major periods of, of depression where I needed to seek therapy and support. And so I had that experience where the therapist that I chose, who was recommended to me by some friends, was ineffective. But I didn't know that. You know, like you say, you're in that condition where you just take anybody. Um, he did not take insurance, it was expensive. Uh, for me personally, he was very academic, very theoretical. I needed someone who was gonna push me more, be a coach, help me become more active and, and almost activate my recovery. But I didn't have the guts to tell that person, you know, this isn't fit for purpose. So it took me many months and then I fired that person and then felt horrible for doing it because again, you're in a condition where you're not feeling 100% about yourself. And so now you're feeling like you've made another mistake. And eventually through trial and error, a lot of trial and error found someone that I really resonated with. Ironically, and this goes to this issue of therapists and non-therapists, it was almost a team approach. So I had a psychiatrist who I liked and trusted, but I also connected with a lawyer who him, <laughs> has set up a coaching practice for lawyers who suffer from depression. And he actually became my most effective um, support vehicle, if you will, because he could immediately identify with what I was going through while also saying to me, well, look, we're going to get going. You know, these are some things we're going to do. And then the last part of it that was instrumental to me, and I hope what this program can offer is I could see someone on the other side. You know, I, I was feeling, uh, which we all do at times, that this is not going to get better. I don't see a way out of this. This is a very dark period. And I don't envision myself being the person I want to be at some point in the future to see someone on the other side who has experienced similar issues, but is able to actually become a very highly functioning person and in some respects better, stronger because of this is very inspirational. And I think you can only get that through someone who has lived experiences and you can connect to those lived experiences. So that was just my um, personal experience, but it's months and years really in the making. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that too. And that also goes to the point, I think that we, we've been talking about too, where your network, your support network extends further than you'd think. You know, you found a psychiatrist that you uh, connected with, but your coach, it's it, it, someone who had lived that experience to you was very helpful. And that's yeah. kind of that, that uh, um, ancillary support network that you found. And I'm happy that you, you found someone like that, that really helped you see kind of the path forward. No, thank you. Yeah. And it's a, it's good old Google, right? You know, I was so frustrated. Um, you know, most states, they have these legal assistance bureaus and, yeah. and lawyers concerned for lawyers, which are tremendous organizations. But the one in my area, I went to a, kind of a support group and a, and a session and there were only three people there. And I live in a major city. I live in Tampa and I'm thinking, that doesn't seem right. I think mean, there's more of us out there. So I typed in lawyers with depression and boom, up comes lawyerswithdepression.com. You know, here we are. And Dan Lukasik, who was this wonderful man I mentioned, was on the other end of that. And just the words, I've been there. Yeah. Changed my perspective. But the lesson is we've got to continue to push, look for those resources, see what resonates. And as you said in the beginning, it's going to be different for everyone. 
um, <clears throat> neither you nor I can tell someone how they should approach their own recovery. We can offer insights. And hopefully you can offer enough that people can pick and choose or maybe something resonates with them. But it is an individual journey. And that's something you touched on in your reflections on grief. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, the journey aspect, I just think that that word is so accurate. And there's so many journeys that we go on as individuals. And my journey is far from complete. And I'm sure, Jim, I'm sure you'd say the same about mm -hmm. yours too. You know, it's, it's a practice. I actually view this as very similar to the practice of law. And I don't want to be too dorky here and, you know, maybe be cliche, but it's a practice for a reason. You practice being a lawyer, mostly because no one's actually very good at it. There are people who are better and who have practiced for longer, but it's because they've, if, I'm sure if you'd asked, you know, the quote unquote best lawyer in the world, if you could discern who that is, that person would say it's because I made a ton of mistakes and learned from them. So I, I really think that that's kind of in line hopefully you don't make as many mistakes in your mental health recovery journey, but there's going to be mistakes um, and there's going to be setbacks. And I am, you know, kind of just understanding the scope of my recovery and my understanding of what I was feeling in 2019. You know, it's 2023 and digesting that vast data set of input. Hopefully, I can get a kernel of output that helps me feel like I'm in a better position moving forward. That was kind of that was kind of what I was hoping for. Um, once I was able to kind of take a step back and reflect on all of the the things that I was experiencing. So, the path the path of grief is universal, uh, unfortunately, and um, people's mental health journeys are long. And even the most well-adjusted individuals are going to have good days and bad days. And I think the most important takeaway for me has been to really think and be open to the fact that you're feeling, you being me, <laughs> I'm feeling a certain way on this day. And you might, you know, I might not even be able to point to why, but this path through severe trauma, someone very close from me, close to me dying unexpectedly in, in a, a traumatic way. Um, that's forced me to kind of reflect and to think about myself in a little bit more of an objective lens when I'm analyzing how I'm feeling in the morning, like even just having that meditation. And I mean, meditation in a very loose sense, people can meditate. And it's something that I aspire to do on a more regular basis. Once again, a meditation practice. Um, but just kind of being a little bit more open, this, this grieving process is open-ended and I, I like to think that I've become a little bit more self-aware because of it. And because I've, um, learned a little bit more about myself. Um, and you know, there are a day, a lot of days where I wake up not feeling great and I wake up thinking about Mark and, uh, or someone in my family, like my mom thinks about Mark and, you know, we talk about it and it's, it's challenging to talk about even still, um, especially on a constant basis, but it's a practice for me. And it's something that, you know, some days I can put more effort into than others. And just kind of circling back to sitting in Dina Bene's office and just having that permission to feel the way I feel and being open to this, the way that I feel in any particular moment, uh, that's really been something that I've trying to improve on and something that I'm trying to be open to going forward. So, um, you know, it's never, it's never done. Those journeys that we're on are long and they'll follow us forever. Um, but they're important. And I hope that I'm able to understand that some days, if you can put one foot in front of the other foot, that's the best you can do. And that's okay. You know, I, I think of a word that I've come to know during the course of this journey that really resonates with what you've just said, and it's grace. Mm -hmm. And the way I think of grace is because of what you've been through, you're probably giving yourself a little more grace than you might have as a law student. I know that is my experience. You know, we to touch on my other favorite word from this talk is dichotomy, right? So we're all driven 
would get into law school because many of us, most of us, all of us, I guess, had, were successful in something. You know, in college, we were in some respects the alpha is the top of our class or the mm -hmm. top of our field. You went to that arena, and there's a real premium on being smart, knowing answers, outworking everyone. You're not taught a lot about vulnerability and understanding imperfection. And I think when you experience it personally and you give yourself that permission, like we talked about, to be imperfect, it actually makes you more aware and more empathic with others and opens your world more. I, I like the image of an aperture that gets opened up. You know, as lawyers, we do tend to be very focused and very tunnel vision orientated because we need to find the answer. We need to dig deep into these legal problems, but that isn't always solving the problem, right? So I think what I hear in your experience is the impact of being more kind to yourself, understanding that others are going on these journeys and maybe struggling as well. So whether those are your clients, your coworkers, your family, your friends, it certainly helps you understand uh, what other people struggle with and maybe provide you the opportunity to just sit with them or walk with them in a way that that's been done with you. I mean, would you say that that's part of your experience? Uh, yes, 100% correct. That That is exactly in line. And I think that grace that you're talking about too, that kindness towards yourself is really difficult for us lawyers because we are so self-critical. I, you know, you, you're practicing law and people are relying on you and people have uh, uh, things that they need to get done and you are the trusted advisor to get them where they need to be. So they call you in because you are an expert in something. That is a heavy burden as I've, you know, I'm pretty early in my, in my career, but that is a heavy burden. And I think that this experience for me has allowed me to be a little bit kinder to myself too. You know, I, I would argue that most lawyers are probably their own harshest critic and that's okay. That helps you make put good work product out there, but it's not going to help you if you're so self-critical that you can't get work product out in the first place, or it's not going to be helpful if you're so self-critical that it hurts you emotionally when you receive negative feedback um, or experiencing some, you're experiencing some sort of trauma. And, you know, the only, your response is laden with guilt. That is kind of my, that's also, I talk about this in the, in the post too, that, uh, that shame or guilt that is helpful in some respects, but one thing that's been helpful for me is kind of understanding where, where that guilt is rational and where it's irrational. And I, I think that that being kind to yourself and kind of giving yourself the benefit of the doubt, I think that that was a really important lesson for me too. So I, grace, that, that grace, it comes, all comes back to grace and self-grace, I think is a, a big part of my own journey. And you know, that's going to be something that I, I keep practicing that giving myself uh, a little bit of a longer leash um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully I, it's something that I keep doing uh, for the rest of my life. That's awesome. You've touched on a lot of really helpful ideas and insights. I'm thinking of someone listening to this or watching this, you know, what are some practical things that you could pass along maybe from your toolkit, things that you're working on currently that would be helpful? Yeah, so it's, I, I, this is, it's everyone's different, right? This is the kind of a, another theme that we have today. Everyone's path is different. Everyone's journey is, is unique. For me, what was helpful, what, that I didn't even know was helpful. This is kind of something that um, almost, I, I, you know, I'm, this is a little bit of pop psychology, but, you know, my subconscious was telling me I needed to go do something for myself, um, telling me I needed to go, uh, something needed to change. And I ended up, um, I ended up going exercising quite a bit and, um, you know, exercise, I incorporated that into my routine and that has been tremendously helpful, tremendously helpful. I've since kind of reflected on that and, uh, understood a little bit more of my motivations for kind of starting that. And that was, I think 
an ancillary outcome for me. And it made me feel good. It helped, um, you know, it helped me take an hour, but I, but I think the real, the real key here is that it forced me to take an hour to myself every day. It forced me to be alone. I'm an extrovert by nature. I get energy from, from speaking with others and communicating and constantly moving. But even I need some time to myself. And I really hadn't thought about that in any reasonable way until I started to take that hour to exercise every day. And then I also, one thing I love doing is I love being outdoors. I love, I love fishing. Um, that's kind of something I did with my dad growing up. And, uh, you know, I restarted that hobby too. And that also is another thing that forces me to be kind of in solitude. The difference between solitude and loneliness probably could have its own podcast. Um, but that was something where I would take time and go be by myself and uh, just be in a beautiful locale where I could focus on, well, ideally I was focusing on, you know, catching fish, but <laughs> it doesn't always happen. Uh, so, uh, but that, that time to myself is really important. And I also started writing um, and once again, quiet time for myself. That, that is also something that I revisited from my past. So I think summarizing all of that, that, that toolkit that you mentioned of, of things that I did for myself outside of, outside of action items that I'd kind of said, okay, I need to get a therapist and, you know, I need to do X, Y, or Z. Um, it all is summarized in uh, me taking some quiet time to reflect. And that is painful and it's really difficult, especially for um, someone like me who likes to be on the go. But I'm really happy that I did it and I, I see a lot of uh, positive results. So that also can include meditation for some people, I think. And you know, I'm very, at the uh, very early stages of that journey. It's kind of hard to sit with your mind relatively empty for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, five minutes. I don't know how people do that, but um, you know, I've gotten um, a lot of people close to me have really benefited from that practice as well. So for me, just that quiet time, solitude, pacing my thoughts, thinking and reflecting when it bubbles up, but that's, that's, that's how I do it. Well, it's really helpful. And what I like about that is I think it'd be easy for anyone to picture how they could do that for themselves. And, you know, as you mentioned, that's what works for you. There's a, there's a whole menu of options for people, but certainly things that take you out of your head, things that can release endorphins, right? That's what exercise does. What I love about exercise as well is it's individual, right? You know, someone walking a mile can be as impactful as someone running 10 miles. You know, it's not a race, literally, um, but it is something that you commit to and that you can feel you accomplish something. You usually have it in your control, right? You can set the time aside, hopefully, and, and do it. And it progresses. And, and I think that's an important part of it as well, right? It builds on itself. And I think that progression that you mentioned, uh, just to add a, a caveat to that too, I think that that progression that you mentioned is super important because, you know, the idea of, you could read Adam Grant's books and, and mm -hmm. he he has a lot of good things to say about this, but the the, the micro steps, the small pieces of habit forming actions that you can take that aren't overwhelming, you see that progression, you see that iteration, you go to the gym, you lift five pounds, two weeks from now, you lift 10 pounds, you know, you run a mile, then you run a mile and a half, maybe you just get into the gym and step on a treadmill in that in that exercise case, that is enough, that is a, that is a forward, that is forward progress. And uh, I think the same can be said with uh, writing, or the same can be said with meditation, and the same can be said with um, really anything that you do, uh, anything that's going to be impactful for you. I think as long as you take a step, it is a good step. And I, and I think that that's actually true with, you know, it comes back to finding a therapist, a little bit of action, find your, find someone who's going to be able to support you and, um, kind of make that phone call if you can. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. And, you know, there's a Twilight Tharp's a well-known dancer danced out of New York City and she used to always say my workout began when I got in the cab so she'd be going in the cab to the gym it wasn't when I got to the gym it was when I got in the cab and there's a lot of wisdom to that just starting and however imperfect it is so Mike I'm going to wrap there because I think we actually have enough for two or three more podcasts and if the world will suffer through it we should do it um I love talking to you I really here. enjoy your insight and this is a fabulous start to this series so I want to thank you for sharing your story 
in, in being so authentic and vulnerable with us. I know this is going to be a help to the BC law community. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being um, just a, a good mentor and a, a good friend too. You've been fantastic throughout the whole process. And I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Me too. Can't wait. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.